Question, Dad. Yeah. Um, yes. If you're taking the exam through disability services, they they will have everything accommodated for you. Awesome. So you'll just show up with your iPad just like here, and every all of your accommodations will be taken care of. And if they don't have an iPad and they're taking it elsewhere, accommodations will yes. be made. Yep. Yep. Through we'll have the so if you have an iPad, you'll use you'll take your iPad with you to SLDS and take it there. If you don't have an iPad, we'll have a paper copy for you there. Awesome. Yep. So you No, that's not. No, it's going to be you're going to bring your own iPad. Okay. Or, um, or they'll give you a paper copy. All right, yeah, or paper copies. You don't have one. Okay, if you have an iPad, so if you don't have an iPad, I'm just going to sit it for a few minutes. Um, if you have an iPad, go ahead and download the Examplify app. <coughs> if you haven't already, some of you have already taken it. Now think about it. Go ahead and download the test assessment here today. We're not going to the practice exam. My recommendation is to get comfortable with the app, do the practice exam that we posted for spring 19. That's in there. Um, you are going to click on test assessment, download your exam. Okay, go, go ahead and go back again. We got a question over here. Yes. I, I know what happened. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, we're going to actually open the practice exam, and I'm going to make you guys a new copy on there. So that way, if you open this one, if you open this one, I'm not expecting you to like go through and answer it. I'll make a duplicate one for you guys to work through this week. Um, I think I know what the test assessment is about. Well, some of them. Okay. Is it that hard? Once it's because they click we it? got it. It's because we had the issue when I can. Well, actually. Let me do this. <laughs> they forgot to create our course when they were making all the exam soft courses. That's why when they sent the original email out, we all tried it the first time, it didn't work. Yeah, give me one second. Let's see if I can just assign it real quick. Let me ask as you're doing if you want to talk to you, yeah. When will the uh, exam be ready for them to download? Good question. Monday. So the exam will be ready for you to download Monday morning at 8 a.m. Okay, guys. So I'll, I'll explain this to you. So you'll go back to Examplify on Monday or at some point before our test on Wednesday. Give me a second. Never mind. Keep talking. Yeah. So what you'll do is download the exam before you get to the exam. Now, sounds great. Sounds like you'll be able to look at the test before you get there, but you really won't. So you'll be downloading the test before you get to the midterm Wednesday night. So then when you arrive at the test, it's already on your um, iPads ready to go. You'll get into Examplify, and you're, you're just waiting for the password from your TA or from whoever the proctor is at the test. So the proctor at the test will give a password. Then you can open the test and start it. This way, we don't have you know, um, 2,000 students who are all taking their tests at 6 p.m. Wednesday night, all trying to download the test and jamming up the Wi-Fi networks um, at the same time. So if you show up at the test, with the test already downloaded, you'll be ready to go. You'll be putting your iPads into airplane mode, so you won't even be using Wi-Fi at all during the test. So even if Wi-Fi shuts down, uh, as long as you download the test, we'll all be good to go. 
And if a few of you forget to download the test at the exam, we'll be able to download those, hopefully without any issues, and you'll be able to start the test as planned. Um, I'm kind of not caring about this example by demo so much. I don't know about the room, but. Okay, that's what, um, if you want to talk about that, what we can do, okay. So you guys have the practice exam up there, and that'll be a good chance to practice it at this point. Um, the thing I'm going to talk about, too, is that quickly, what you're going to do if you have an iPad, you're going to um, walk in, you're going to give your uh, proper, your ID, they're going to give you scratch paper. You're going to give you scratch paper that's periodic table, uh, supporting information. The other thing, too, is that when you're done, you have to show your proctor that you've submitted the exam and it's uploaded. And you have to show them that um, you give your scratch paper back. That's the biggest thing is you make sure we give the scratch paper back. Yes. Um, my recommendation is please, if we can't, for some reason, and I'm trying to look through it and I don't, I don't quite understand why, um, please take the practice exam on exam solve so that you're comfortable with using the class. <coughs> It's the Spring 19 version, which we have an answer key, a PDF version of on Carmen. Um, I recommend go ahead and do it for this. Any questions? Yes. guys so we're going to continue along with where we were at last time so we were um, really getting through stoichiometry we have a question open on top hat so why don't you guys take um, a look at that question give it an attempt and um, I'll give you guys probably three minutes so I'll give you a one minute warning so take about three minutes if you haven't looked at the problem you have to give it a try
pretty good friend. Uh, Dr. Turner. Yeah. You call him Dan. You call him Dan. Uh, he teaches OCHEM this semester. He taught Gen Chem last year. So. He's like, um, he like uh, coordinates the exam. Okay, guys, let's, let's look at the answer first, and then let's talk about something, and then we'll um, come back to this question. Pretty sure that's the right answer. Okay, so let's leave the uh, work for a second. I'll work through the problem a couple of ways, but there is a, a good question um, of what information you get on the exams. And so the best place to probably figure that out is through the daily quiz page. So if you were to um, go to the daily quiz page, not that you have to go there right now, but you can download this thing. It says use this following information when you're taking quizzes and practice exams. If you open this file up here, then it has some yellow um, highlights in it that are the basic equations. Um, there's no equations yet through where we're at in the material, but th those come later in the class. So no equations yet. Um, I, I guess technically one equation that you might get given if you need it is that kinetic energy equation out of uh, chapter one, like the one half mv squared. But, uh, but so like key equations, like usually we provide you with complex equations if you need one, and sort of your non-standard conversions. Like we're not gonna give you the prefix conversions. So in terms of like giga, mega, kilo, semi, milli, micro, nano, pico, those are the ones I'd expect you to know. Um, the conversions of. So generally just try to get the order, because once you know milli is obviously minus three, micro is next, so you know that's the next three, so that's six. Next is nano, so that's nine. And then the uh, pico is the minus 12. So it's, once you think of them in order, it's pretty easy. And then like mega millions is where we're at. Now we're not yet the giga millions with the lottery, so maybe someday we'll be giving out trillions of dollars, but um, we're up to uh, 10 to the six is mega, 10 to the nine is giga. So that's what I expect you to know. Um, other conversion factors shown here. Most of the conversion factors, uh, like if you look at a particular exam sample inf information, it's usually very limited because you usually don't need much of this stuff on a given test. So you can look through this as you're taking practice tests, as you need information. If it's in yellow, something you'd be given. If it's not in yellow, a lot of times it's just the opposite conversion. So most of the things that aren't highlighted are just like how you could define, you know, the number of centimeters in an inch. Like we'd give you that. It probably seems obvious to most of us, but there are you know, maybe international students who are new to inches, so maybe it's a new conversion for some people. But the, um, the other conversions you sometimes see are then how many uh, um, inches are in one centimeter. It's like you don't need both conversion factors. You just really need the one obvious one. Okay, so with that aside, we'll head back to the... Uh, There it is. Okay, so let's come back to this top hat problem. Okay, so um, I had posted a uh, video solution for the previous problem that we ended class with on Wednesday. Um, I don't think we have class time for me to go through like four different solutions for that one problem. So we had like a particle question. If you might, if you remember, we had like 10 N2s, and, like 24 H2s. We were trying to figure out how much NH3 we could make. It was like a limiting versus excess reactant problem. But it was one where it was slightly complicated to maybe use a particle diagram, but we could still think of these molecules as particles and how they react together. I think it's really important for us to think that if we had two H2 molecules, they'd be reacting sort of one at a time with an O2, making two waters in the process, and just continuing that process um, through the course of the reaction. Uh, but the, the question usually becomes, is there some other way to solve the problem? Like one of the ways is a BCA chart. So sometimes you might think, okay, we'll just start with what we have before. And this is usually not um, a bad way to think of these problems. So we'll start with 12 grams of H2, 70, um, uh, we're told that we, you form 76 grams of water. So initially there's none. You have 12 grams of H2. We're gonna lose some of that. Then eventually after there's some change and we look after, um, then we realize that there's 76 grams of water that forms. Now, one of the ways I think of a BCA chart, though, is when I start thinking of these changes as like a minus 2x 
minus x and a plus 2x. That when the reaction starts, we have reactants present. We're going to make some products. So that's why we're losing the reactants with minus signs. We're gaining the product with a plus sign. That the x's here, um, these are by moles, not by grams. You know, so when I start thinking of the quantity of H2 I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose 2 moles of H2 for every 1 mole of O2 that I lose. So the x is actually by mole. So I might do a second calculation here and sort of think about the moles if I'm going to think about a BCA chart. Now, we can show like an alternate method, and I think I will show two methods for this particular problem, so that maybe uh, we're not necessarily always using this BCA chart, but it's kind of helpful maybe for us to think that 12 grams of H2 divided by 2.016. So we can, I, I think a, a gram to mole conversion is pretty easy for us. So I'm just thinking, okay, what's the molar mass of H2, the number of grams per mole to make that conversion. So I can write in 5.95 moles before, just to go from grams to moles. So the BCA chart is going to be much more helpful if I have units of moles in here. Likewise, if I do the sort of conversion of water's mass to moles, it's 18.02 grams per mole. We start doing a lot of CO2 and water problems, so I think probably you'll start memorizing these molar masses, but we're just taking 2H plus the O. Um, so 76.0 divided by 18.02 grams per mole. So I'll, I'll show that just in case somebody's lost. That the number of moles of water would just be equal to the 76.0 grams of water times 18.02 grams per one mole of water from its molar mass. So we could probably do a lot of these calculations in our head, if you will. So there's 4.2. Um, I'm going to keep an extra sig fig around, I guess. I don't know if it matters too much. But um, 4.217 moles of water form in this reaction. So the question is asking, um, uh, so H2 is reacting with an unknown amount of O2. So we don't know that quantity. Maybe I'll just put a question mark in for that. And so then how much H2 remains and how much O2 had reacted if the reaction proceeds to 100% yield. That 100% yield, sometimes you see, that just means assume the reaction's occurring as it's written. There's no byproducts. So we're getting exactly the quantity of water you would expect out of this reaction. OK, so one of the things that we could do is solve for x. Now, at this point, you may be kind of lost to, well, what's x? Well, come back to the original picture that we had H2 present and an unknown amount of O2, no water, and then we're producing about 4.2 moles of water. And for every two moles of water that we're making, we're losing one mole of O2, two moles of H2. So we can get kind of that, that x factor, if you will, the quantity of water sort of per mole that was being made. So we can solve for x and you say, well, I know x is going to be equal to 4.217 divided by 2. So I can look at this already and say, OK, I know now that x is just equal to 2.10 eight uh, moles. So that tells me that I lost twice as many moles of that in terms of H2. So I can take 2 times that x. It's still the 4.217. Subtract that off of the H2 moles. So after the reaction, I should have my 5.95 moles initially of H2 that were present. And I now have lost 4.217 moles, giving me 1.73 moles of H2 once the reaction has completed. So the reaction completes. I had 5.95 moles. 4.217 of those moles had to have reacted to make the given quantity of water that was produced. So then how much oxygen had to have reacted? Well, it's going to have to be that 2.108 moles. OK, and so then we can use their molar masses to figure out the number of grams. So the, um, the quantity of hydrogen that remains would be 1.73 moles. So grams of H2, 1.73 moles. And then one mole is two H's, so it's 2.016 grams. So that's 3.49 grams. Then how much oxygen reacted? Well, it's the 2.108 moles times now 32 grams per mole of O2. So just be careful that you use the molar mass of whatever the substance is. If it's O2, then we use 2 times 16 as the molar mass, or 32.00. So 
So 2.108 times 32 would work out to 67.5 grams of oxygen that had reacted. Okay, so now, if you're looking at this problem, if you ask me, this is kind of a tedious way to solve the problem. It's maybe not necessarily the way I would think to solve the problem, but I know that the lab teaches the BCA chart, they do pop up in the book, um, and it is one way to think through this particular problem, is setting up the BCA chart. Now, what I like to do when I use the BCA chart is try to keep it to moles. And then if I think, if I need to do conversions, I kind of need to think my gram to mole and my mole to gram conversions almost separately, or in like separate layers of the chart, if you will. So you can maybe have two layers of before, maybe two layers of after. But think of your X's. We have to go with that reacting unit of moles or molecules whenever we're thinking of those X. Okay, now, I have this example um, where I was thinking the number 3.49 was gonna come out. So copied here again so I can think through this maybe a second way. That is to say, well, what if I understand the idea that we're making water, um, that we're consuming oxygen and hydrogen? I can probably just apply and think through this problem using dimensional analysis. Now, if I hadn't made sense of a BCA chart, if that's still kind of confusing, maybe we need to come back to a particle representation, then maybe think back to the N2H2 example and just start thinking for two molecules of H2, one molecule of O2. Uh, a mole of H2 is an Avogadro's number of H2. So an Avogadro's number of O2 is also uh, a mole of O2. So one mole of anything is just an Avogadro's number of that particle. So I still need two moles of H2 to react with one mole of O2. Maybe that's confusing. So when I say uh, the reaction says 2H2 to 1O2, that could be molecule count or mole count. And hopefully that's not confusing because an Avogadro's number of molecules is a mole. So if I need two molecules, I need two moles to react with every one molecule or one mole of the O2. So if the BCA chart doesn't make sense, we have to make sense of that probably before the dimensional analysis makes sense. But, but let's take a look at how we might solve this problem with dimensional analysis. So the way I might think of this is I could figure out the number of grams of H2 that had reacted by just looking at the mass of water, reasoning that it's 18.02 grams per mole of water using the molar mass, and then it's going to the coefficients, that for every two moles of water produced, that two moles of H2 had to have reacted. And so where this, the only place where this problem becomes tricky is we just have to remember that when we're calculating the grams of H2 here, that it has to be the grams of H2 that had reacted, not the quantity that remains. We just have to apply thought. Um, the, um, and, and maybe it's annoying to say this, I don't know if it's annoying to hear this or not, but like, th th this is have a problem, you just have to think your way through. There's not like an easy way to just program your brain of what steps do I do to get the answer. You just really just have to think your way through this problem because when we do the problem just in one dimensional analysis string, we get a number, we just have to keep in mind what the number means. So we get the moles of water converted to the moles of H2 that had to have reacted times 2.016, and we get um, What the heck am I getting 8.5 grams? No, computer. Yeah, I'm laughing too. Yeah, okay, this is funny. <laughs> the, uh, I was thinking I was wrong, and it's wrong because I'm not thinking. I, somehow my brain turned off. <laughs> and it's, it's really funny. And the reason why, okay, so this is a good example. Like, so what I was thinking is I was like, it's almost like a good reminder 
that we're not calculating the H2 that remains here, we're calculating the H2 that had reacted. So when I get the answer is 8.50 grams, which is what my calculator says, and for some reason I freaked out because I thought it was wrong, that's the right number. The number of grams of H2 that remains would be the initial that we had present. We initially had 12 grams of H2 present, and so this is what we have initially. And then if we have reacted 8.50 grams, then that quantity, the difference is what remains. So that's the three and a half grams that are left over. So this is where we get the 3.5 grams of H2 that are remaining in the reaction. So uh, dimensional analysis works. You've got to keep your brain on. Uh, I think it's probably more helpful to solve the problem once and not be confused by the previous work you had done. But, uh, but the key is we can just solve this with dimensional analysis. We have to remember this is the grams of H2 that reacted. So that's the only place where the dimensional analysis solution is maybe tricky is if you forget if the 8.5 is the grams of H2 that remains or had reacted. It's just the H2 that had reacted. And you can solve the problem the same way for the number of grams of O2 that had reacted. It's 76.0 grams of water. Same conversion to moles. 18.02 grams per mole of water. Now it's two moles of water being produced for every one mole of O2. And then a mole of O2 is 32.00 grams. So we can solve for the oxygen. Now that is going to be directly the number that we're looking for in this particular problem. So if we do that calculation, we should get directly the number that we're being asked for. So probably not a bad idea in these problems is to be just mindful through the problem. So when I get 67.5 grams, like just maybe double check and see what the problem is asking for. So the problem was saying how much H2 remains and how much O2 had reacted. By the stoichiometry, I'm figuring out the grams of oxygen that had reacted to be able to produce this quantity of water. So when we work through stoichiometry problems, we do these mole to mole conversions, it's just sort of figuring out, well, for that much water to have been made, how much hydrogen had to have been reacted, how much oxygen had to have been reacted, and then we carefully look through the information to see how we answer the given problems. So stoichiometry problems just kind of vary. They're all a little bit different in what they can ask for. They might ask for, you know, um, give you information in a slightly different way. So you have to be really careful to read through the information, understand what it's asking, and try to apply the best way or a way to come up with an answer. Okay, so let's look at another problem on Top Hat. Let me give this just a, a bit of a setup here where, um, like this problem is looking at aluminum and O2 reacting together to form Al2O3. Um, I actually didn't give the reaction, so we could possibly think of that reaction that we're just trying to make aluminum um, react with oxygen to form Al2O3. So I might leave that to you guys to balance. It's probably easy enough to balance. But think about balancing the reaction and then trying to uh, figure out a yield of the reaction, just remembering that the yield is the actual over that maximum theoretical yield times 100%. So a big thing that we might remember here is our percent yield. Is this our actual yield divided by that theoretical or the maximum yield times 100%?
All right, one more minute. That's right answer. Let's take a look at this one. So again, I'm going to think through two ways on this problem too, because I want us to just make sure we try to understand with the BCA chart how it might be used here. I think this is not so much of a hard problem to use a BCA chart. I like, I, I usually when I get mole quantities, I think a BCA chart is really easy. Gram quantities, I'm probably going to think dimensional analysis first might be the way I tend to think through a problem. But whenever we're picturing a reaction, one of the two reactants has to go to zero. You know, like one of the two reactants and it really just becomes maybe a problem if I have to figure this out or not. Like if I told, if I told you you had like 10 grams of aluminum and like 20 grams of oxygen, then you're going to have to figure out which of these two is truly going to zero. It's possible they both go to zero. If we give you the magical, you know, stoichiometric amount, then they both could go to zero. But you're assuming one of them goes to zero. Um, and so then based on that is sort of how you're basing the yield of your reaction. So we'd expect all five moles of aluminum to be lost. X is really easy to see here, right? It's 1.25. If you just solve for X and say, well, what's X equal? If 5 minus 4 X is equal to 0, then X is just equal to 1.25. And I think it's almost a little scary when chemistry problems just become an algebra problem um, and, and maybe loses its meaning. But it really doesn't lose its meaning because you're just saying you're losing four times as much aluminum as you are gaining Al2O3. We have to have these balanced coefficients of two in front of Al, two O3, so that's four aluminum, so that's why I have a four in front of Al, six O's on both sides. So I'm gaining two X of the Al, two O3, which we now see would be 2.50 moles of Al, two O3. This way here, I don't know if we've used this notation before, but giving the molar mass is an M equals, that's to help you so you don't have to calculate a molar mass in the problem to save you from doing the two Al's plus, and looking it up plus the 16. So look for those in problems. We don't always give them on exams, but sometimes we'll give you um, molecular weights um, of the compounds to speed up a problem. So if you have 2.5 moles, that's just going to be using one mole of Al2O3, has a mass as given, 102.0 grams. Okay, and so then this yield here, 2.5 times 102, it's 255 grams. So that was our maximum yield that we should have gotten in this reaction. The actual yield is the yield that we had been given. 185 grams was actually obtained. So the actual yield divided by that theoretical yield. Now I mentioned I'd, I'd show a second way. The second way is just, in, in probably the obvious way, is just saying, well, we can calculate the number of grams of Al2O3. The only thing with dimensional analysis sometimes becomes, well, how do you know when you should put moles or grams? Well, if we're calculating a yield, we're given an actual yield in grams, and we want, of course, the theoretical yield to be in the same unit. So you just have to have a little bit of thought to like, look through the problem, see the information given, to know we want to go to grams of Al2O3. So we would just start with the 4 point, or not 4, 5.00 moles of aluminum. And just use four moles of aluminum, react for every two moles of Al2 produced, Al2O3 produced. And then just use the molar mass. So now, as you can see, the dimensional analysis step is much less writing, much less work, but the thought is still there. Like the thought of what's going on up here is still taking place when we're writing out our dimensional analysis work. So the 
if the chart makes sense, then that'll help us understand the dimensional analysis steps so we understand what we're doing here. We're saying if you have five moles of aluminum react for every four moles that react, two moles of Al2O3 are produced, and using the molar mass, we can get the grams. And it should come out to 255 grams as well. Okay. So let's move on. There's actually a question. I think the next one is a question on Monday's lecture notes, and then we didn't get to it. It was on Wednesdays. We didn't get to it. So um, this is more of a problem-solving idea from something earlier in the chapter. So this is a bit of a, uh, um, a throwback to something earlier in the chapter. So give this question a try. Try to just use your ideas of formula and problem-solving strategies to solve this problem. Don't feel like you should know how to solve it. Try to apply yourself on this one. Yes. <laughs> What's that? I think there are quizzes planned, at least Monday and Tuesday. I'll have to double check. But yeah, I think there's at least two more. <laughs> All right, let's do one more minute. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. Okay, so um, on this one here, it says uh, we have two cations per anion, uh, and it's also a metal oxide. So the, like, one test taking strategy is if we go through the choices, like RFO2 doesn't even have two metal cations per anion, it just has one. And then um, xenon oxide, this is a weird one, but like the XeO2, the Xe2O, it's not a metal oxide. So like this wouldn't form a metal oxide. Like we need an actual metal cation per anion. So sometimes on exams, you could look through the choices or perhaps like examine the information, try to see if there's some way to rule the answers out um, as that basis. 
Now, one other thing that like, you could almost rely on then is potassium is not that heavy you know, relative to oxygen. So the percent O in K2O is just going to be definitely not 5% by mass. So it's probably B. OK, so that's one way to think through a problem, is you could probably uh, reason through the choices if you at least give them a glance and see if it's possible to rule some answers out. Now, you won't always be able to do that. Sometimes you may look at the choices. If they're all metal oxides, um, then we couldn't have used and ruled any of the answers out very easily. Now, given that, we can also show how you might just use some simple ideas. Like, remember how we talked about percent masses of given elements? So the percent O of these compounds would just be 16 AMU, because that's the mass of the one O that they each contain, divide by the formula weight of the actual compound times 100%. And then we know that that's 5.68%. So what I could do if I wanted to, if I wanted to verify this problem, what I could do is say, since I know that 16 AMU of the formula is oxygen, the rest is whatever the metal cation plus oxygen is in terms of the formula weight, I could solve for the formula weight. So I might write 16.00 AMU divided by the formula weight is just equal to 0.0568, kind of getting rid of the percentage and the 100%. So just expressing that as a fraction. And I could cross multiply and then divide by the 0.0568. So if I put 0.0568 into 16, that'll tell me the formula weight of the compound. And then from there, I should either be able to verify that it's cesium by just calculating the formula weight of that compound, or um, um, you know, by subtracting the O mass, divide by 2, and then verifying that's the atomic weight of cesium. So there's a few ways I might approach this problem of either saying, well, can I just take the cesium mass or figure out the metal mass by taking the formula weight minus 16 and then dividing by the two cations. You can do a lot of math here, but the math is very simple. It's very thoughtful that we're thinking through on how we're getting there. Or we're just simply adding up and comparing which of these compounds matches the formula weight. Now, the last thing I'll say on this problem is I think RFO2 just matches close to the formula weight. So if you went with RFO2, you probably just had the formula weight, or it has a similar percent O. So if you just calculated the percent O's, you probably went with RFO2 just because it happens to have a percent O that's about 5.68%. OK, so that's just one general problem-solving strategy um, that we could uh, apply on that particular problem. OK, now, for this last one, let's try to uh, you know, spend three minutes on this problem if you can. Pretend like, if you will, this is a test question. You're given Na2 or, uh, sodium and, and Cl2 reactor form NaCl. Write the reaction, balance it, determine the mass of NaCl that forms when the particular quantities of Na and Cl2 react. With the caveat being that you don't know which one's limiting versus excess. So, and you won't be told that. A lot of problems you'll have to figure that out or know to figure that out in the problem.
One more minute on this one. Okay, so let's wrap this one up really quick. So this problem here, you could do a BCA chart. You could write in the moles, maybe convert, and just reason out one of these reactants, or both of them are going to zero to figure out which of the reactants is the limiting reactant. Um, the other thing that you could probably do is um, just figure out how many grams of sodium chloride could we get if we consume all the sodium, and figure that mass out. And then figure out what's the quantity that we could make if we consume all the chlorine. Okay, and so the issue is that one of them is going to make more than the other if you have an excess reactant present. So which one makes 58.5? Which, which is the limiting reactant? Sodium or chlorine is the limiting? Sodium. So this one equals 58.5 grams. If I run through this and consume all the chlorine, what does that end up as? Does anybody have that number? That's going to end up at an amount that's higher number of grams than 58.5 because once we hit 58.5, we run out of that limiting reactant. And then that's it for the reaction. We can't continue to make more NaCl because we're out of that reactant. So this is probably the most general way to solve a problem is with this dimensional analysis step. Hopefully the BCA chart helps you understand the math behind it. All right, guys, that's all for today. Have a great weekend.